On the show today, we really only have one topic to discuss, and that's Andy Stanley. We're going to look at his response to criticism he received from his unconditional conference he held. Um, He held at his church last month. So just one topic, but a lot to discuss. So let's get to it. Welcome in. This is Religionless Christianity. I'm your host, Spencer, and we're so grateful that you're joining us. If you're new here, um, we like to make sure we say it up front and early that our show is not religionless. Uh, It's the nation and especially the world that we live in that is religionless, increasingly secular. So that at least in part is where the name comes from. Um, But we're going to try to do today what we do every Saturday, and that's just you know, take in the stories from around the world that we think are of particular importance to Christians and, you know, try to, I don't know, dissect it with a Christian worldview, if you will. So um, that's what we're going to do today by looking at Andy Stanley. I think uh, there's a lot of application in what we have to discuss with Andy Stanley. And I think his perspective, um, speaking of Andy Stanley, is very uh, pervasive in America today, so I think it's important to discuss. But before we get to all of that, is there anything you'd like to say? Any prayer requests? Any praise reports? Anything of that sort? Um, I know it's like a a small prayer request, and I'm sure a lot of people who have kids have dealt with this if they have older kids. But we, since we homeschool, our kids are doing a a homecoming kind of later. Um. Yeah, you can't find a decent dress for your daughter. Um, If anybody knows where you can get some that don't look like lingerie, please let us know. Um, So their their homecoming will be next weekend. But um, yeah, we're going to look at the thrift stores and such. But there's a place that, um, yeah, just has nice dresses that are modest. That would be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, just let us know. Yeah, so. please do. Um, <laughs> they definitely don't make it easy, that's for sure. But uh, we do want them to dress modest because modest is hottest, as the, uh, <laughs> the song once told us before it got pulled down. But um, and then also just pray for, I would say pray for me. Um, I tend to bite off more than I can chew a lot of times. I get myself unnecessarily busy. Um, even in busy in things that I think are good works. Um, so oftentimes I need to be reminded to slow down. And I think that's the point where we're at. So, you know, we kind of talked about how we're going to do the Saturday, you know, Bible readings and stuff. And I just don't think we're going to be able to do that um, and still make time for other things. So we'll see. Maybe when life clears up, maybe we'll get back to that. But just pray for me that I learn how to have a good balance in my life. Uh, and I don't get myself too busy to where I don't have time for other things that need to be taking priority. So I'd certainly appreciate that. But um, one more prayer request is uh, to pray for Israel. Uh, you guys have no doubt seen and heard about the attack that happened in Israel over this past week. And uh, we're gonna, you know, get to our discussion here on Andy Stanley, but you know, I just want to take some time to highlight, you know, this news story here because this was really a unparalleled attack from Hamas. I mean, when it first happened, you know, Nikki was asking me about it, and I'm like, ah, they always attack. Like, what's new? And then, you know, once I actually looked into it and heard some people discussing it, you're like, holy smokes! Like, this is kind of a whole nother level. Um, of what they, you know, did in attacking Israel from what I gather, we sit today somewhere around, I think last I heard somewhere around 1200 dead in Israel from the attack, which I heard someone do the math that that would sort of equate to somewhere around 30,000 Americans, you know, if you would have taken the size of the nations into account. So 1200 dead is a staggering number from an attack in Israel. Um, you know, it's kind of, you put it in perspective, that's like 
what happened to us on 9-11 times 10, mm -hmm. you know, and 9-11 led us to a 20-year war. <laughs> and so what is times 10 of that? But just wanted to highlight that. And, you know, as we sit here today, as I've thought about this over the past week, I'm about 51% in support of Israel, uh, you know, kind of both from the Americans' perspective, because Israel is one of our great allies in the world, um, but more so, I think, because I'm a Christian, I'm in support of Israel. We are not people that hold to the belief that somehow the church has replaced Israel as God's chosen people. And I think Paul um, makes that clear in Romans. Do you want to read, honey, Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 31? For I do not want you, brethren, to be oh, uninformed. Hold on, I got the wrong verse up here. Oh, you pulled up the wrong one? I'm reading the right Romans one. Romans 11, 25. Yeah, there we go. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written. The Deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. Yeah, so, um, you know, we long for the day that the fullness of the Gentiles have come in, because mm -hmm. uh, I would assume that means that the Lord is now near, and, you know, so we support Israel. They're God's people, and um, we are God's people, so we support them. Um, one of the things I heard, though, over the last week was from our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, and I think he mentioned that, you know, the U.S. government, they were still supporting a two-state solution. And I would just say, Nikki and I, personally, we don't support a two-state solution. Um, yeah, I think we support Israel reclaiming their homeland, and I would mention all of their homeland, um, the whole mm -hmm. bit of it. You know, Israel was given that land. God gave it to the Jewish people, what, 4,000 or so years ago when he promised it to Abram. Yep, so we'd like to see them reclaim it. But, you know, apparently our nation and the leadership, they think they can diplomatically bring about peace. Because in their mind, the Islamic terrorists, they just need new iPhones and uh, a McDonald's on every corner, and then they'll be as happy as we are. <laughs> so uh, we don't agree with that. And I think this, in my mind, is at least a large part of the reason why we lost the war in Afghanistan. You know, our biggest problem to me was that we never addressed the worldview issues. And I believe it's because we're a nation and a national leadership that don't have a worldview alternative that's capable of addressing this sort of religious worldview. You know, Hamas, just like Al-Qaeda, just like ISIS, they're Islamic. And Islam has really been kind of a murderous and barbarous religion since its founding, though it's been a very serious religion since its founding. And we aren't going to overcome, you know, this kind of religious worldview with what we have to offer, which is materialism, sexual perversion, idol worshiping of money. And uh, mm -hmm. that seems to be really all our country has to offer and try to persuade these people with. Um, and the problem with this sort of worldview is it's the worldview that comes from the exact same source as Islam, which is Satan. Right? You're not going to overcome Satan with Satan. <laughs> so a Christian worldview could overcome it and has in times past um, because God can overcome Satan. But our nation isn't seeking that solution because our leaders in many respects are opposed to God. You know, so Islam's evil is all people and religions that reject Christ are. So 
we support Israel in that respect. Not that Israel is accepting of Christ by and large, but again, they're still God's people. So we support Israel 51%. The other 49% of me um, is the part of me that doesn't trust anything our news media or political establishment tells us. And this story is no different, right? Um, To me, you know, as I was thinking about this, it's like, well, you know, this could very well be like the military industrial complex, just sort of a money grab. You know, we've just seen in the last few years, the honeypot that was the war in Afghanistan, a 20 year, you know, bank run almost just ended, I think something like $10 trillion spent on that war, like unspeakable amounts of money. And that's sort of dried up now. And then, you know, America seems to be kind of done with whatever Ukraine is or was. Um, Even members of Congress now are starting to push back on the endless funding. I heard a stat yesterday. They said since 1947, so Israel is our one of our great allies in the world. Since 1947, we've given $158 billion to Israel in foreign aid. Tons of money. But since 2022, we've given $130 billion to Ukraine. Almost the exact same amount of money. So they've just been pouring buckets of money into Ukraine. But that seems to be drying up. So maybe, again, this is just sort of the conspiracy center in my brain. Just by happenstance, all of a sudden, you know, as Ukraine's drying up, nobody's for it, then all of a sudden, war in Israel. Just to sort of get everyone back on board with this, you know, war slush fund that seems to be never ending in our country. What is the reason for all the funding that they, I don't know, can you explain what you mean? Like, why they want to fund that much? Well, I mean, they fund that money because it doesn't just necessarily go to, you know, the government in Ukraine or whatever. It goes to defense contractors and partner nation contractors. And it's And again, this is what people would claim, right? I'm not saying I have any insider information on where this money is going, but, um, you know, just like the war in Iraq, it wasn't necessarily just going into Iraqi citizens' hands. It was going into um, things like, you know, Raytheon and um, Booz Hamilton and Halliburton and these big defense contractors that the government by and large is in bed with. I mean, if a lot of our politicians, this is what they do. They serve in Congress, they serve in the military for however long. And then when they retire, they basically walk across the street to these sort of executive level positions with, uh, you know, these big defense contractors. So again, that's sort of where the conspiracy part comes from. We, as the government officials, we give, you know, whoever Raytheon, this massive multi-billion dollar contract to build whatever for the defense industry for these wars with sort of the kind of wink and a nod that when I retire, I got a job waiting for me, right? It's the same thing we just heard from Pfizer. If you remember that Project Veritas video that they did with, um, they got some executive from Pfizer who was kind of on research and develop uh, development, I think. And they sort of got him drunk a little bit and they were talking to him and he was mentioning that, yeah, you know, all of these um, governmental Uh, employees from sort of the FDA and um, these different oversight uh, organizations, he's like, yeah, they're pretty soft on us because they know that if they go too hard, you know, their jobs aren't going to be waiting for them when they leave the government service. Oh, wow. So it works just the same, the medical industrial complex, the military. So again, that's the 49%. I don't want to get drug off into this. I just don't tend to believe what they say. So at least in the back of my mind, there's a small nagging bit that's like, yeah, I don't really know what's going on. So either way, pray for Israel. A lot of a lot of people suffering over there, um, whether it's happenstance, unintentional Islamic extremism, who knows, um, but just pray for them. So yeah. that was a long prayer request, but yeah. pray for Israel. Um, let's get these plugs out of the way here quickly, and we'll dive into Andy Stanley. So you guys know that we are proud members of the Christian podcast community. It's a great place to go find 50 to 60 good Christian podcasts on any podcasting platform you like to listen to. 
If you want to listen to podcasts about the global day of jihad in The Believer, an argument for gay Christianity, or Hulk Hogan on Joe Rogan, <laughs> it's all over there. Uh, you can go find it, and I think your soul will be blessed by it. And then um, you guys know that we're big fans of Cardinal Contingency Solutions. So, you know, if you happen to find yourself in a place like, oh, let's just say Israel, when a Islamic terrorist organization overruns your country, are you prepared to handle that? I would imagine most people are not. But Cardinal can help you get prepared for that. So reach out to them, see what they have to offer. If you got missionary teams or if you're just traveling to any place in the world, as the world is currently on fire, and they can help you out there. And then last thing, if you want to help the show here, uh, liking and subscribing, whatever platform you're on, is the easiest way. Uh, doesn't cost you anything except a few seconds, and it would certainly bless us and benefit the show. And then if you feel like uh, going and making some purchases, I know Prime Day has just ended, but uh, I'm sure deals are still abounding. Did you get anything? I did get some things. So, you know, my framework laptop's coming in soon. I had to buy a new hard drive. and Was it a good deal? Sweet deal. Um, <laughs> sweet deal. So we'll have links down in the show notes. There are affiliate links to like Amazon, Christian Books, Best Buy. Um, and then there's also our Patreon links down there. Um, buy me a coffee. If you sign up as a Patreon, you don't get anything from us except... Uh, a prayer request list that we're trying to get, you know, a little community of prayer partners on. This isn't the 90s, you know, TV prophet that promises you for the certain amount of money, he'll bless whatever kitchen rag you send him and uh, none of that stuff. It's just simply partners on a prayer list. God will bless as he sees fit. So all of that would be greatly appreciated. It would be a great blessing to us. So... <clears throat> <clears throat> all that out of the way um, we're going to go ahead and play the music here because we're talking about Andy Stanley's version of Christianity which is a horror show um, we consider it kind of Andy Stanley's gospel of cheap grace so we will get into this if you want to read this headline in the first paragraph or so Andy Stanley's unconditional contradiction Late last month, North Point Community Church hosted the Unconditional Conference, billing the gathering as an event for parents of LGBTQ plus children and for ministry leaders looking to discover ways to support parents and LGBTQ plus children in their churches. It would stake out a quieter middle space on a contentious, contentious topic, the organizer said. As critics were quick to note, the Atlanta Area Conference featured speakers who are either in same-sex relationships or supportive of those who are. Yep. <clears throat> so we went this week and we listened to, we couldn't really find much audio from the Unconditional Conference itself, which I think turned out to be good. Um, because we actually went and listened to Andy Stanley's Sunday service or his Sunday discussion, if you will, from North Point Church, um, where he sort of gave a response to a lot of the pushback that he's been receiving about this conference. So, And I think that's better than us just listening to the conference, having him explain it just makes it more clear. It kind of, he said pretty much what we thought that he said, if we would have listened to it. Like, just, No, I agree. Yeah. I, I like this better because he's again you're getting the overview of his understanding about the lgbtq plus identity i guess but more so just his views on sin as a whole which i think is yeah. far more enlightening so yeah i think this was a better option mm -hmm. uh you know you guys will have to see for yourself as the show unfolds but we do again just have this one service that we're going through a lot to discuss about it so we'll just go ahead and get right into it. This service that he had was called I Love My Church. That's the message that Andy Stanley was giving. So let's hear this first clip. Starting from his version of biblical Christianity. So I want to go on record and say, I have never subscribed to his version of biblical Christianity to begin with. So I'm not leaving 
anything. And he, if he were here, he would say, well, Andy, I've never subscribed to your version of biblical Christianity. And that's okay, we can agree to disagree. But this is so extraordinarily misleading. In my opinion, just my opinion, his version of biblical Christianity is the problem. Gosh, that's just something you don't say. Like, you don't agree to disagree on the core message on the gospel. Yeah, it's, it's kind just, of a weird thing say that. to say. <laughs> you know what? It's okay to disagree on the entirety of biblical Christianity. I would say, no, it's not. Uh, you might be able to disagree on a point or two, but if you're completely disagreeing on the entirety of someone's theology and stance, that's probably not okay. But the gentleman that he's referencing here that he says he doesn't subscribe to his version is Albert Moeller. That's the gentleman that he's subscribing to. And again, this whole service was sort of prompted by Albert Moeller's um, article that he wrote uh, sort of regarding this unconditional conference that Andy Stanley held. So we'll link down in the show notes both of Albert Moeller's articles. He actually wrote one and then like a second one to Andy Stanley's sort of response to his first one, if you will. So there's two articles. We'll link them both down in the show notes if you want to read what Albert Moeller had to say for himself. But uh, he says, Albert Moeller's Christianity is the problem, right? And this is the version of Christianity that Andy Stanley doesn't agree with. And what version is that, you might be wondering? Well, Albert Moeller is the president of Southern Baptist Theological Semin uh, Seminary. So, you know, a good place to go and look for yourself to figure out what exactly Albert Moeller believes is the Baptist faith and message. That's sort of, if you remember the kind of scuffle that has been happening over the summer with the SBC, it all sort of surrounded their Baptist faith and message and those who weren't adhering to it. You know, that what that's what led to the removal of Rick Warren in Saddleback um, mm -hmm. was because of the Baptist faith and message. So that's what Albert Moeller's version of Christianity is. And if you, again, want to go give that a read for yourself, we'll link the Baptist faith and message from 2000 down in the show notes, and you can go and see what exactly it is that Andy Stanley doesn't subscribe to and never has, um, which I believe is interesting because... Mm -hmm. His father, as far as I understand, if I can remember right, he was a Southern Baptist, wasn't he? Charles Stanley? I think he's a Baptist, but I don't remember if he was Southern Baptist or not. Either way, <clears throat> it's interesting to consider the camp that Andy Stanley finds himself in. Um, because it's sort of, it's him, Rick Warren, Stephen Furtick. These are kind of the guys most recently that have been at odds with the Albert Molers of the world and his version of Christianity. I wonder what his father would say, because he just passed this year, right? Well, we talked about it, and his dad, I would say much to his, um, I don't know if shame's the right word, but much to his chagrin, maybe he was supportive of Andy Stanley, even though their faith yeah. was very different. At least they would say that it was very different, but still, okay. you know, um, he was supportive, went and preached at Andy's church. Andy came and preached at his church, all that sort of stuff. So I'm not sure necessarily um, what he would say if you actually sat him down and had a maybe a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Charles Stanley. You know, but this is kind of the camp that Andy finds himself in. Um, he, you know, men like Albert Moeller, if you will, they're of a more orthodox Christian faith if you want to call it that, I guess, more of a traditional faith. And um, these sorts of men, not just Albert Moeller, but many of that ilk, if you will, they've warned of people like Andy Stanley, Rick Warren, Stephen Furtick, of departing from the more traditional or historic mm -hmm. Christian teachings. You know, you got Andy here, who's sort of the affirmation preacher. Then you got Rick Warren, kind of the chief seeker-sensitive preacher. And Stephen Furtick's over there is kind of the great self-esteem, pop psychology, mm -hmm. um, cool preacher, if you will. I don't know. So uh, Andy says that he's never prescribed to that version of Christianity. And I think just that very statement should alarm us in some way. Uh, that should yeah. be sort of the first thing that jumps out. You never, you know, prescribe to any sort of kind of traditional understanding of Christianity. 
Um, kind of interesting. And I did hear this week, I've mentioned to you guys before, the MacArthur Center podcast. Um, it's a really neat podcast. They use sort of John MacArthur's life and ministry as kind of the backdrop because he's been in ministry since 1969, but it's more so about all that's occurred throughout these 54 years or whatever it happens to be. So one of the things they mentioned in episode two, they brought up Andy Stanley specifically, and they mentioned that he graduated from the Dallas Theological Seminary, which he graduated during a time when this sort of view of free grace became really prominent at Dallas. Uh, And it's essentially the idea that you can have salvation from Christ without submitting to the lordship of Christ. That's kind of a topic that took root uh, at Dallas at that time. It's kind of the idea that submission to Christ's lordship is a work. It's seen as a burden to people. Yeah, it's seen as legalism. It's crazy. Yeah, it's this idea that even telling someone they must submit to lordship is saying they have to do a work in order to gain salvation. And they're like, no, 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 just, and this is kind of, you know, where the idea of, you know, just say a prayer and you're in, Mm -hmm. and you can always remember back to the prayer you said, and that's your sort of confirmation for the, when you were saved. So this is where Andy Stanley grew up and where he came from. Um, And again, that sort of seems to be accurate with Andy Stanley. And as you go through this discussion here, I think you'll kind of see that. So I'll link that episode as well. It'll be linked down in the show notes if you want to give a listen to that. It's a very brief section on Andy Stanley, um, but it's more about this idea of, you know, that's one of the things John MacArthur gained notoriety for was lordship salvation. He gained a lot of notoriety and a lot of pushback for that view. So you can go give it a listen, see where you stand on the idea. But let's listen to this next clip here from Andy Stanley and all the other complexity that gets globbed on to the message. Bottom line, that version of Christianity draws lines and Jesus drew circles. So this is why Andy Stanley says Albert Moeller's version of Christianity is wrong because his version of Christianity paints the picture of a Jesus who draws lines and Andy Stanley's version is a Jesus who draws circles. Well, that line would be, I don't know, the fence. Which side of the fence are you on is the question we all need to consider. Which side did you choose, Christ or the world? So, yeah, what's this circle he's talking about? Because there's a side. (laughs) Yeah, it's an interesting uh, statement to make there, but it's a lie. Um, That's when I heard, I was like, this is just simply a lie. And This is a false teaching that's pervasive in America today. You know, this notion that Jesus is love and he's just love, that's all he is, that Jesus was accepting of any and all, all you had to do was come to Jesus and Jesus would be yours. Like that's sort of the lie that's pervasive in America today. Yet this is not the Jesus that we see in the Bible. So I don't know if Andy Stanley's just reading the Passion Translation, so he's missing it, but probably, you know, we don't see this, right? Think of the rich young ruler, Mark chapter 10, you know, verse 17 through 31. Jesus tells him to sell all that he has and give to the poor. And then if you want to read here, honey, verse uh, 22, Mark chapter 10, verse 22. But at these words, he was saddened and he went away grieving. For he was one who owned much property. Yeah, so just thinking like... He was sad. He went away grieving. Do you think he was grieving because he wanted to follow Jesus, but he knew that he he couldn't if he was also holding on to the idols in his heart, you know, money, his riches? the, uh, The price that was, you know, asked to be paid was too steep for him, right? Give up all of your old life, give up everything, you know, give up the thing that's most important to you. You know, Jesus wanted it all, not just most of it. He wanted it all. And I would say that was a line that was drew, right? That wasn't a circle. Jesus drew a pretty stark line. Yeah. Sell everything you have and come follow me. And it was a line he wasn't willing to cross. That seemed like a line to me, right? 
you know, what we don't read after these words, right? Mark chapter 10, verse 23, isn't Jesus calling the rich young ruler to come back to him and going, "Ah, I know that it's hard. Just follow me anyways. He just lets the man leave. Yeah. He gave him the the stipulation. He drew the line and the man, he, he wasn't willing to do what it took. That seems like a line to me. Same thing, Matthew, uh, in the tax collector, right? Luke chapter 5. Let's read Luke chapter 5, verse 27 through 28. Do you want to read those? After that, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and got up and began to follow him. Yeah, he began to follow him after he left everything behind. Yeah, it says he got up and left everything. It doesn't say that Matthew was called, and then he decided after his shift, you know, that day that, well, now I'll go and follow Jesus. Or he didn't work with the Romans and go, you know what, can I maybe take a long weekend, and I'll be back on Tuesday after following Jesus for the weekend. I'll come back and collect taxes on Tuesday says he left everything. Yeah, you have to count the cost. What, is, what does it cost you? Yeah, Jesus oh, told him to follow world. me. There's yeah. the line. And he, Matthew, he made the right choice, right? He became a new man in that instance. Christ drew the line. Matthew made the choice. And he made the right choice, the correct choice, where the rich young ruler did not. I just have one more story here. Not story. Uh, verse. The adulterous woman. Do you want to read that from John chapter 8, um, just verse 11? And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. Yeah. Jesus, you know, he doesn't say go and sin no more. But if you find that, you know, sinning is kind of difficult to give up, well, then just sin a little bit or, you know, Either way, I'm just going to accept you because I draw circles and not line, right? He says, go and sin no more. There's the line, right? It's a pretty clear statement made by Jesus. Now, again, we don't know if she does or not, but, um, you know, everywhere that we see someone coming to faith in Christ, we see submission to his lordship and leaving their previous lives of sin, Um, except apparently at Andy Stanley's church. His church, it's a circle-drawn church. No lines to be fine. No sharp edges at Andy Stanley's church. I know this circle. I guess I'm just trying to think of like, I don't know, an image with this. The circle is like the sheep in their pen, but Jesus opens the gate and he says, "Come follow me." <laughs> yeah. So we got to get out of that circle that he's talking about. Like, nope. Jesus says, "Follow him." You don't stay in the circle because that is. You can't follow Jesus in the circle. You have to get out of it. The circle of sin. Yeah, it's the circle I can of think sin. of something clever too. <laughs> <laughs> Lines and circles. I'm like, no, Jesus opens the gate and you go out into the pasture with Jesus. Yeah, yeah. you can stay in the circle of sin or go follow the, the shepherd. But, um, you know, this idea that like Andy Stanley saying here, that Jesus just drew circles, just accepted everyone <clears throat> with no caveats. It's just a lie. Um, Christ, I mean, the truth of that is Christ accepted and does still accept Mm -hmm. all who will confess him as Lord and obey his commands. You know, those are the terms of service for Christ. You know, whether you're a Pharisee like Paul or you're a prostitute like Mary, again, all are welcome. That circle, in a sense, exists for all in the circle to come to him. But the lines are drawn as far as what it takes to actually become a disciple of Christ. Mm -hmm. And this is really the bait and switch of American Christianity. You know, they point to the fact that, well, Jesus welcomed sinners, right? He welcomed the tax collectors. He ate with the tax collectors. He was friend of the, the prostitutes and the sinners and all of that. And they say, see, Jesus loves sinners. So if you're a sinner, then Jesus loves you. But they leave out the actual important part that, all those whom Jesus called gave their lives to follow him. Mm-hmm. They left the old life for the new life. Um, that's the part that they seem to be leaving off. You know, all of that sin that marked the lives before coming to Christ, uh, they moved past. 
You know, that was behind the line. They stepped over the line. You know, to the Andy Stanleys of the world, Matthew was still the tax collector. Mary Magdalene was still the prostitute. And they just preach a non-transformative Christian life. They preach an apathetic Jesus, if you will. You know, in their mind, to me, it seems that, you know, they know Jesus can't change you. So he just accepts you as you are. That's a weak and powerless Jesus. I was going to say, that's a weak God there. Yeah, it's just a lie. So don't believe it, this idea that Jesus doesn't draw lines. He most certainly does, and we see it over and over in Scripture. So let's move on. Let's take a look at this next clip from Andy Stanley. Tell anybody, maybe it's just going to go away. And most are overwhelmed with a sense of something is wrong with me, even though I haven't done anything wrong. So this is Andy sort of explaining the angst that a lot of these LGBTQ children and such, um, because the conference was largely about children. Unconditional conference was about parents dealing with LGBTQ children. Does it really mean like little children? Like No, like you could have an adult child come and tell you yeah sure but i think this yeah yeah, it was more geared towards kids that were getting older and growing up and stuff but you know this is his big point here you know what are you gonna do right you have these kids and they tell you there's something wrong with me even though i haven't done anything wrong and now he's trying to figure out a way how do we address this big issue they haven't acted on that sin they just have the desire well, I just what he means. Well, I think no. I mean, he means like I didn't do anything for this sin. I didn't oh, want okay. this nature. It just happened to me. I haven't done anything wrong to earn it. But what a golden opportunity for the gospel, right? The true gospel. Uh, maybe Andy Stanley doesn't preach that one, but the true gospel that like, yes, you have done something wrong. We've all done something wrong. We were born as people who can only do wrong. Mm -hmm. And apart from a Christ who's actually powerful enough to save us, all we will continue to do is wrong. Like, rather than coddling this idea that you're right, honey, you haven't done anything wrong, and it's unfair for you, so let's figure... You point them to Christ and the truth of the gospel. We're all sinners. We've all done things wrong, and we're all, you know, apart from Christ going to receive our just due punishment from God for eternity. To me, that seems like a a golden opportunity for the gospel. Um, but I don't know that Andy preaches this Jesus again. They seem to preach the apathetic, powerless Jesus. Um, but again, if you're preaching the real gospel, you can point them to the Jesus who raised men from the dead, that turned stone or hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. Like, what a golden opportunity that Andy Stanley seems to be missing. So, uh, again, in his mind, and I don't know, you know, maybe you sit down and talk to him. What's his view on children and their sin nature or sin nature Mm -hmm. in general? You know, original sin and all of that sort of stuff. I'm curious to know where he stands, um, given this sort of statement here. I haven't done anything wrong. Um, Would you talk to the murderer in the same way? I haven't done anything wrong to have all this murderous rage. That's I mean, so crazy you that you can, you can be the victim. Ugh. So we'll keep this thing moving along here. We got lots of clips from Andy Stanley. Here's the next one. Um, again, I couldn't find any helpful resources. So I knew who could answer this question best. Some months earlier, I had met with about 15 gay adult attenders who attended our campuses that we had contacted through the years. And I always was wondering, why do you attend our church? You know, I mean, based on how we teach and preach and I mean, why do you attend? So I'd had this fascinating conversation. So I knew a bunch of their stories. So I emailed, I think six or seven of them. And I said, I'm putting this training together. You know, I'm kind of making some of this stuff up but you've had a bad church experience that I know you don't want repeated for this generation of kids with same-sex attraction. So here in this clip, uh, Andy, you know, he says that basically when he was putting this training together, which he kind of highlights his training that they've done for a decade now, when he's putting this training together on how to help same-sex attracted kids, he reached out to attendees of his church 
that were same-sex attracted or in gay relationships. So there are people who just settle when they're saying it's okay, it's not a sin. Like, Sure, seems to be that way. Um, As you listen to the rest of this, the people that he has helped let him or helped him build this training platform are people that, again, they are acknowledging that they're in same-sex relationships, married. They're people who are married. Okay. In this training platform. So, you know, Andy, right, he sought the advice of those who didn't overcome sin in order to train the next generation of kids trapped in sin. That's essentially the logic here. Like, what sort of plan is this? So we used to have people come to our high schools and, like, they would say, oh, I used to be addicted to drugs and I overcame and encourage kids to not do it. Yeah, that would be the way to go with this. Somebody who's overcome. Yeah, this seems like the exact opposite. (laughs) This is like having a drunk lead your AA meeting or having like an abusive spouse lead your marriage seminars. That seems to be the equivalent of what North Point Church here This is their strategy on children expressing LGBTQ tendencies. Hey, you're struggling with this sin of, you know, sexual immorality. Well, here's a bunch of people who never beat it. How did like odd strategy? Is the the goal is just to keep the kids in the church so they don't lose their faith, but it's like they don't have a faith. Right. And that's kind of the, one of the points that he makes here. Uh, he makes the claim, and I don't know where he gets these numbers from, but he does use them. He says that 86% of LGBTQ people grew up in the church, but they leave the church at twice the rate of straight people. But what church is he talking about? Like, is it just the evangelical? Like, I don't know. What kind Again, of Again, I church? don't know where the numbers come from or what churches, but... I, either way, I don't think this is a shocking stat. I think it's meant to be shocking. But, and again, I don't even know if it's true, but even if it is, I don't think it's shocking because why wouldn't they leave, right? Sinners always flee from the righteousness of God. That's sort of what makes them sinners. And people that don't come to a saving faith in Christ tend to leave the church. Yeah, that's just, yeah, why like point out a certain sin? It's people who are living in open rebellion against God in whatever sin, that number's the same. Yeah. Should be. It should be the same number. 90% of Satanists grow up in the Christian church and then they leave the church. How can we get the Satanists to stay? Well, they're Satanists. That's why they left. I mean, I don't know. Unless they get <laughs> saved and transformed, they're not yeah. going to stay. That is so... <sighs> so I think it's maybe supposed to be a big number that shocks you. I don't know why that's shocking. But if they all stayed and stayed in their sin, that's that's not a Christian church. Right, and that's really the invitation that Andy offers here is, let's draw a circle and let's let these you know people stay, even though they never get transformed by the gospel. But as long as they're here, then everything's all right. Uh, I would say that is not a good message. Wow. So uh, this next clip, We'll just keep this thing going. We got a few more to get through. So the three purposes, to love their child well, number two, to help their child, to to help parents point their child toward Jesus. This is what Parent Connect does because kids detach from their, oftentimes detach from their faith, depending on the church they're in, depending on the language their parents have used, depending on the language their parents use when they respond to their kids. So to teach parents how Even if you're not so sure, you disagree with the decisions your kids have made, how to continue to point them to Jesus. I know, I was was thinking about this, like, what's wrong with having a shocked reaction? It is something. If your child came and told you that, it would be a big disappointment. It'd make you depressed. Like, it should have a reaction that way, a negative reaction. What is wrong with being upset over it? It's like, yes, you love your kid, but... Whenever they do anything wrong, you show disappointment. And in saying that you identify with the sin, instead of just committing a sin one time and like confessing, this is saying, this is who I am and I'm not confessing. And you have to accept it. Like, that's something that it's okay to react 
um, in, yeah. in a way of anger even because it's- You should react. I mean, I would guess if you love your kids and you've been trying to raise them in a certain way and then they come and tell you, I'm living completely opposite that, you know, of the way you taught me. Like, what do you mean? You know, hey, mom, I sell meth for a living. Like, what? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Uh, instead of being like, meth, huh? Hmm. Interesting choice of profession, Johnny. No, you'd be shocked. But to me, and this is why I wanted to highlight, this is sort of his um, parent connect is their big sort of umbrella group for helping these parents of LGBTQ kids. What does he mean by to help parents point their child towards Jesus? It's like, well, if you've been raising them to walk, you know, you've been pointing them toward Jesus all their life. Well, and that's why I wanted to highlight this part, because this thing, to me, as he says this, sounds like a completely sort of self-focused, self-centered idea of saving faith. Because he says in there, like, if you say the wrong words, if you respond in the wrong way, well, then you could steer your child away from God. Like somehow your thoughts and your words are more powerful than the Holy Spirit in Andy Stanley's mind. Yeah. They wanted to come to Christ, but yeah, you, you were shocked when you should have been calm. And now they're Satan's children. Like, no, that's completely ridiculous. It's a sad thing. It's a thing to grieve over. Like you grieve over the death of someone who's passed. Like you grieve over the spiritual death of your child. This is them coming and telling you, I'm on the path to destruction. They're telling you right now, I have walked away from Christ. Unless they're coming and confessing, I've been dealing with this. I've been ashamed. I'm confessing it as a sin. I'm not confessing it as my identity. And that's the difference there in your response. If they're confessing it as their identity, yeah, that's grief. And that is normal. They need to see you grieved, that you that you care for their soul, for their eternal um eternity. Like this is them coming and saying, I'm going to be separated from you for eternity, burning in hell. How else should you react? But are they coming to you and confessing, I've been struggling with this sin. I know it's a sin against God. Please pray with me. Help me. Like take me to get help. Um, I love Jesus and I don't want to sin. Those are two completely different circumstances that he doesn't talk about. Right. And like your response should be hopefully measured and Christ-like and all of that sort of stuff. Um, Certainly it should be. And again, if you've laid sort of the groundwork and the foundation of raising your children according to, you know, biblical commands and in a biblical way, then yeah, even if you're shocked, again, that's not going to steer your kids away from you. Oh, mom was shocked when I told her something. I'll never tell her anything again. Like, I think that's completely untrue. Um, But then again, it's just, to me, this speaks more again to Andy Stanley's view of a powerless God Mm -hmm. that somehow just simply in that one instant, in that moment when your son or your daughter comes to you with this terrible burden that they're in, if you mishandle this, you might just steer your kid away from God. That's just simply not true. Um, Jesus says that he'll, he won't lose any of whom God has given him. Mm-hmm. Your words, sure, we want to you know speak words of love and um, build people up in their faith and this sort of stuff. But to think that you simply being shocked when you should have been calm sends someone to hell for eternity is complete nonsense. Yeah. Just nonsense. <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, but there's still more wasn't to equip parents to debate with their kids. The purpose of the conference, of the unconditional conference, was to equip parents to connect with their kids and to reconnect with their kids and to stay connected with their kids so they would have influence to keep their kids connected to their faith and keep their kids connected to Jesus. So you debate, yeah, that's just conversation. Like, what does it mean to him to debate? Um, there's nothing wrong with debating. Debating the faith isn't going to turn them away from Jesus. That's what is necessary, is just discussing the scriptures. What does Jesus say? What does God say? 
Yeah, I mean, to me, as he's kind of explaining this, it seemed like to me kind of the purpose of this conference was to soften sin in order to keep kids, you know, who are living in sin just connected with the church. Just keep them here, right? Get them in the big circle. And to me, it just sounded more like a business strategy than a spiritual growth strategy. Yes. Um, Because, you know, from the very beginning of God's covenant with man, God was calling men out of the world, calling them out from among the world. You know, Abram, he was a pagan worshiper that God called out of Haran, right, to leave his people. And God was going to set him apart and make him a nation. You know, the law that... God gives to Moses, you know, he gives him the law so that by adherence to this law, God's people will look different than all of the surrounding nations. Um, Those people that are outside of Israel, I think we were just talking about this at church, you know, Israel was kind of a natural bridge from Africa up to Europe, and people passing through that Israel land or Israeli land would notice a drastic difference from the life and the practices of these people than all of those around them um, in hopes that these people would also seek after God, right? In Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, God tells Abram, let me pull it up here. God tells Abram when he calls him, he says, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You know, that was God's purpose. And Andy Stanley's message seems to be make the church look and act like the world, accept sin and make them comfortable so then they won't leave. Well, what does it matter if they're staying in a supposedly, you know, so-called church that lets them be completely worldly? sinful, accepting of it. What does it matter if they're in that church or not at the end of the day? I don't know. How do you handle, how are we told to handle when someone in the church is living in unrepentant sin? They're not to gather with the believers. There is a thing called church (laughs) discipline. We need to do the same. Not that you don't bring your little kid to church, but I mean, depending on their age, you know, you don't treat it that way, but... Maybe they do. Maybe that's part of their membership onboarding process. They bring in these people that are in unrepentant sin, and they bring them into the church, and then they sign them up as members and immediately put them under church discipline. Is that the strategy? I would assume not. So maybe church discipline is another thing Andy Stanley doesn't practice, because I don't know how you would practice yeah. it and also be completely accepting of it at the same time. Yeah, because you can't. You can just have the excuse, uh, well, I'm a thief. I ask God to take this away, and I still have the desire, so I guess God wants me to be a thief. Yeah, like how do you have a an elder in your church or whoever and has an affair on his wife? You're like, Bill, we're bringing you under church discipline for the adulterous relationship. And they're like, you just onboarded 17 professing gay married Christians. Yes, Bill, but this is different. <laughs> like, all oh, okay. Uh, so maybe church discipline doesn't exist in Andy Stanley's church, but it likely doesn't. We're never taught to be soft or accepting of sin in order to somehow draw sinners to Christ. Mm-mm. You know, we should love them, of course, and we should stay connected to them, of course, especially if it's family. But where do we just accept it in order to save them? We don't see that. Again, this is his misunderstanding of lines and circles, in our opinion. Let's listen to this next clip. Of those parents. And this is why Justin and Brian were invited, the two married gay men at the center of all the controversy. And I'm sure that you've read all about that. And here's the thing about Brian and Justin. Their stories and their journeys of growing up in church and maintaining their faith in Christ and their commitment to follow Christ all through their high school and college and singles and all up to the time that they were married. Their story is so powerful for parents of gay, especially kids, that it's a story gay parents with gay kids need to hear. 
It is virtually impossible, and you know this if you stop to think about it, it is virtually impossible for a straight heterosexual parent to understand what's going on in the heart and mind of their same-sex attracted child when oftentimes their own child can't or won't verbalize it. All of us have felt shame about things we haven't done. But I bet you've never carried shame about who you are. That's the difference. And when people say to me, well, Andy, it's just like, I just stop them, I say, no, this is not like anything. This is an is, it is a category all unto itself. So have you ever felt shame for who you are? And never once in my whole life, because I am not an LGBTQ uh, member. No, this is a, so just backing up, he's explaining again, why he invited these gay married, supposedly Christian members to come and talk at the unconditional conference. That's why he's mentioning them. But this whole point that he brings up is completely untrue. And it's a lie that this nation's been telling for a very long time, that somehow sexual sin is different or unique from all other sins in existence. Is it is it pointed out as a different sin in scripture or is it lumped right in there with all the other sins? It is, and yet they don't read it that way, right? He says this is something completely unique and different. You no. can't possibly understand it unless you've experienced it, is his point of view. But this is the thing. We are all sinners. That is our identity before we come to Christ. You can say, I was born a homosexual. Well, I was born a sinner too. I was born with an inclination toward certain sins as well. Well, there you go again, preaching that Albert Moeller kind of faith. Andy Stanley doesn't agree with that Albert Moeller kind of faith where we're all sinners. This is unique. This is sexual sin in a very specific form of sexual sin. This is LGBTQ homosexuality. It's an entirely different class. There's a third testament, a new New Testament written to deal just specifically with that sin alone because it's so different. But it's completely nonsense. It'd be the idea where you would say like, hey, if your kid has a, you know, a murderous rage, well, you better bring in a murderer to talk to him or else no one can reach them. Well, it's like he's saying this is the one sin Christ is not powerful enough to tear down in your life. Yeah, Christ has been bested by this sin. Yeah. Like, what is it to Christ? He's defeated sin for us. He's given us his Holy Spirit and to overcome all sin. It didn't say you can co- overcome all sin except homosexuality. No, this is a complete lie that Andy Stanley is um, pitching here to his church. And, you know, we do start to see this, or we have started to see this in other areas. You hear this a lot in the abortion argument, <clears throat> you know, that somehow if you aren't a woman, you don't get a say. You know, men have no say in abortion as though somehow a men can't understand what murder is. Uh, it's just a lie, right? And then also on that, our opinion here, we would say married men or married gay men are not Christ followers. He talks about these two guys who followed Christ their whole life as they struggle with this sin and gave into the sin and then got married and live in the sin. They're Christ followers. Um I would say no. I would say there are people They're who not saved. like some of Christ's teachings. Mm-hmm. You know, they like the idea of mm-hmm. Christ's salvation, but they reject the the idea of Christ's lordship. You, you come to Christ to be free of your sin. If you came to him for some other reason, you're not his. You can't live in open sin like that. Like the main thing he came was to defeat sin for you. Right. That's the like, whole idea of judging the tree, you know, by the fruit and you can't hold on to this one rotten fruit. Like, yeah, even one, if there's, you know, freedom from your sin. And again, that's even the idea of repentance, right? You can't repent of a sin you're willfully living in and, you know, identifying yourself with that's not a repentance sin. I want to bring up because he brought up shame in your, I, who you are. The thing is we all have shame is a good thing. We all have felt shame in sinning against a holy God. 
There's nothing wrong with that. That's the thing that's supposed to happen. But when you're in Christ, if you're truly saved, you no longer have shame. We will not have shame when we stand before Christ on judgment day. You have shame at the beginning when you realize I am a sinner and I am ashamed that I have sinned willfully against against a holy God who has, in all he's gone through um, to save us, that's a good thing. Would you agree? Shame is a positive thing in the beginning. He's saying shame, we shouldn't have shame. But even homosexuals who are living in open rebellion against God, they should have shame. That's good. You want them to be ashamed. Yes, of course we should. This idea that somehow you should never feel ashamed of, you know, ashamed of yourself because that's not of God, it's wrong. That shame should lead you to a place of seeking, you know, the solutions and then repenting and then being free of that shame once you've, you know, moved mm-hmm. free of that sin or been transformed and um, died to those sins. But the idea that you should just never feel shame and, you know, I, it's just untrue. It's like saying, you know, you hear this from time to time that you shouldn't feel guilt. You know, Christ has forgiven you. You shouldn't feel guilty. No, that's untrue. And not only is it untrue, we know that it just isn't real because we have memories. God gave us memories. And a lot of that is so that we can continue go, uh, to go back and praise God for what he's done mm-hmm. for us. If you just forgot all of the sins that you, you know, from your past life, and when, then you would, you know, you'd forget or have no reason to go back and praise God for his goodness. Right. You know, right. If you don't have the shame and the guilt and that that doesn't linger <clears throat> somehow. Again, it's not shame where you're beating yourself up, but it's right. that shame that drives you to repentance. It's not guilt. I don't know. People have different definitions. Shame, it goes with humility. You are ashamed of what you've done, but you know the mercy of God in it and you go to him. But if you have condemnation in your mind, then you will run from Christ and you won't go to him for forgiveness. So you have to know who he is, that he's merciful and forgiving. So that's, that's, that's who he is. So when we do sin, you know, we sin every day, especially in our thoughts. And we go to God instead of fleeing from him. We go to him because we know him. We know that he will forgive us. We know that he knows our heart. He knows when we have sorrow over our sin, and that's the Holy Spirit conviction. There's a difference in shame that leads to humility and running to God and and just a condemnation feeling. But if you flee from God when you sin, that means you don't know him. You don't know that he's merciful because if you knew it, you would go to him. So it just proves if you know God or not as your Savior, as your Heavenly Father. Yeah, so we would disagree with his point here on these men. And, you know, and again, just that idea, you know, like he says, that these men have spent their lives following Christ, um, when in fact, as we mentioned, they've lived in willful, unrepentant sin. You know, First John chapter 1, verse 6, uh, it says, let me pull it up. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Um, that sounds like simple. what these men are doing yeah. here. And, you know, I think more so than these gentlemen being a good teacher for young children, we certainly would disagree with that. But I think also what Andy in this conference is doing is terribly unloving towards not only these children, but also towards these men, because they're making them feel comfortable and secure in their salvation when they are not, you know. What a scary place for Andy Stanley and the rest of the preachers like him that make you comfortable in your sin. Um, Very dangerous, you know. And even, again, just this idea that sexual sin or or even like, because it's all tied back to sort of the nature versus nurture kind of a thing. And, you know, the nature argument like, well, if they're born this way, it's the way God made them. And, Mm -hmm. you know, but if somebody's born with like a gluten intolerance or allergic to peanuts, we don't just go... Well, you should eat bread and you should eat peanuts because you like them. And it's just unfair to live a life where you don't get to have the foods you like. Nobody does that, right? We would tell them, hey, you know what? It's unfair you don't get to have bread. It's unfair you don't get to have peanuts. 
But you have to avoid those or else you're going to pay the consequence. We tell them that. Yet we don't do the same thing with sin in this Mm -hmm. nation anymore. Instead, we just go, boy, you know, it is really unfair that you were born being prone to a certain type of sin. And therefore, spending your life rejecting that sin or trusting in God that he can help you overcome that sin, you know, that's unfair. So instead, we just say, well, if you were born that way, then that's no longer a sin. It's no longer a big deal. And God, somehow, now he approves of it. So just go ahead and live your life the way you want. Um, That's the way we seem to handle sin, but we don't handle other things in that same manner. And, you know, although even to that extent, right, we're still selective in how we choose which sin becomes acceptable, um, like homosexuality and LGBTQ, and which isn't. Because we've never had a pastor like Andy Stanley, to my knowledge, hold a conference that murder is accepted by God. They don't bring in an avowed Christian assassin as a key speaker for young children, right? We don't do this with the corrupt, greedy businessmen. And why is that? You know, why are we comfortable having people involved in the sin of sexual immorality go and preach to kids about how somehow that's acceptable in God's sight, but we don't do it with other sins. And right, my guess is that we see the damage of those other sins. Mm-hmm. We see that in the physical world. You know, we can't really see the spiritual um, ramifications and the damage in the spiritual realm that sexual sins cause, and therefore we don't take them serious. And I would say that that makes it not so much a sin problem. It makes it far more a faith problem. Well, if you take it so far and your kid is not just, I mean, because the trans ones were in here too, LGBT. um, And if they go ahead with that surgery, yeah, we're going to see the ramifications of that. All of the things that go wrong, um, you know, a lot of them end up getting cancer and just the hormone injections and all of that, um, that is doing harm to their body. Um, yeah. Well, and we should have seen them. it too, even with, you know, the AIDS epidemics and all of these. Right. There's diseases about, that come with homosexuality. That wasn't enough to wake us up either. Yeah. Um, but I do, I do think there's a large part of that, of lack of faith, where if I can't see it, I can't touch it, then it's not real. Um, which again, that's not a sin problem. That's a faith problem on your behalf. So um, let's hear what Andy teaches about sexual ethics. Kids are, they are the best. Again, thoroughly satisfied customers. But as it relates to sexuality, here's what we teach. And hopefully you know this. I feel like if you've been coming for a while, there, there should be no question about this, but I don't mind just putting it out there. We teach what I refer to as a New Testament sexual ethic. In fact, I wrote a whole book about this, the new rules for love, sex, and dating. Father has called you to live this way is because he loves you. And here it is, it's just three statements. Number one, honor God with your body because the Holy Spirit lives in you and your body is how people know what you believe and where you stand. And your behavior through your body is to exemplify the goodness of God and the grace of God and the love of God. So you always honor God with your body and you always honor other people's bodies. Number two, don't be mastered by anything, not by porn, not by a sexual addiction. Don't be mastered by another person. Don't be mastered by your infatuation. Don't be mastered by your lust. Don't be mastered by anything. You have a master and he's a king and he loves you and he created you and he knows what's best for you. And number three, the old fashioned one, don't sexualize a relationship outside of marriage. So that's Andy Stanley telling you what his views on New Testament sexual ethics are. And again, he says that it's, Number one, honor your, honor God with your body. Uh, don't be mastered by anything and don't sexualize any relationship outside of marriage. Um, but first off, I mean, is this biblical sexual ethics or is it Andy Stanley's personal sexual ethics? Because again, this is what he says he's taught for 28 years, yet then at the same time, and this is why the Christianity Today story talks about the um, unconditional contradiction, I think is what they called it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Unconditional contradiction. Because he's saying, this is what I've taught for 28 years, yet I completely accept, make room for, hold conferences for the complete opposite, right? Because how can you honor 
your uh, honor God with your bodies while doing that which dishonors God. Yeah, he says what you do just shows really if you're a Christian or not. He's saying, well, the the fruit is how you tell someone's a Christian or not. He worded it different, but yeah, he's he's preaching two different things. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely talking two different messages here. Because again, right, Isaiah 55, 7, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord, mm. right? You not just show up however you want, be whoever you want, and God accepts you. You're not honoring God with your body if you're doing that which dishonors him. And you're also not honoring somebody else's body when you make them partake in sin with you, mm -hmm. which homosexual uh, sex would be doing that, right? You're track And again, that even goes into love your neighbor as yourself. You don't love your neighbor if you're dragging them or helping them partake in sin. You just don't do that. Um, and you're not loving your child by not correcting them um, when they turned from God. Like, we're supposed to um, continue loving people in the church, it's, you know, it, with church discipline, admonish them as a brother, but don't eat with them. Like, don't have that fellowship with them as if they're part of the body when they're not. But you want to plead with them to return to the faith, but don't pretend like everything's okay and church is usual. You know, like they can't come and like have communion and how are they praising God, you know, singing these songs about being free from sin while living in sin. And we see stories like this in the Bible. If you think of Eli and his sons, uh, was it Hophni and Phinehas? You know, Eli, the, the judge in Israel before Samuel. And the reason Samuel gets raised up is because Eli raises two wicked sons who depart from the faith and they act wickedly before God. And what does God do? Does he just bring them into the temple and accept them? No, he kills them in a battle kills Eli, and basically wipes his family out from ever serving the Lord again. You know, but we have people today like Andy Stanley who call themselves preachers that don't fit the mold of what a Bible preacher, an Old Testament, you know, prophet, judge, all these people, they were steadfast in holding to God's truth. They didn't soft sell it. Mm -hmm. It was God's word. That's what they stood on. You either accept it or you don't. You deal with the ramifications or you don't, but our modern day preacher is completely different. It's Andy Stanley. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to tell you what God's word said, and then I'm going to let you be completely living mm -hmm. in, you know, objection to all of that, and then tell you you're blessed by God but at the same time. This is the spiritual equivalent of people thinking they're a different gender. Um, so someone who's living in open rebellion, open sin against God, but thinking they are a Christian. It's an unbeliever thinking they are a Christian. And you're affirming that they are a Christian when they're not. It's like affirming a gender when they're not that gender. It's just it's just the spiritual equivalent. Yeah, it's spiritual affirmation therapy. I yeah. guess um, is what Andy Stanley but convincing preaches. someone they're saved when they're not that's not loving and going along just for the sake of making someone feel accepted and loved you right, comfort again, that's them why in a it lie seems like a business strategy you keep them in the church and that's good for business I guess so he's kind of saying as long as they're in the church like they're saved he's saying if you go to church you're a Christian pretty much maybe that's his point of view. Um, but I mean, all of these points are wrong, right? So honor God with your body, that's wrong. He doesn't actually teach that in this church. Um, and then he says, don't be mastered by anything. But, you know, living a homosexual lifestyle, knowing it's against God's design and purpose, as he mentioned, yet accepting it as who you are or as your identity is acknowledging that you are, in fact, mastered by it. But you're That's thinking that you're God doing. is going to grade on a scale. You're one of those people that says, but all these other areas in my life, I'm, I, I submit to your lordship. But in this one, I don't. If you don't confess that one thing is a sin, then you're not. Like, God doesn't grade on a scale. 
Well, that's literally the story of the rich young ruler. Yeah, I've it kept is. all of it, God's laws yep. since my youth. We'll do this one thing. Eh, I can't do that one. Okay, well, then you're not a follower. Have a nice day, right? That's it. Yep. But then even this third point here, he says, don't sexualize a relationship outside of marriage. Well, marriage only exists between a man and woman, you know, so any relationship, sexual relationship outside of that is by its very nature, like an immoral and sexualized relationship. Uh, so the whole thing, I don't know where he's, where he's going with it. And I'd love. I wouldn't love to, I wouldn't want to sit through, but I don't know how you teach that ethic while also accepting and promoting a complete rejection of it at the same time. I know he got up here to like help people who are confused and he just made them more confused. <laughs> well, and that's even, you know, even Christianity today, I mean, for all of their flaws, they saw through it. So mm -hmm. um, goodness sakes. Um, we got one more clip here from Andy Stanley. So let's see what he has to say here. Or dated women, nothing changed. He expressed it with his tearful nights, praying that God would change him, but God did not. So this little short clip here, Andy's talking about how, you know, these gay men and stuff he talks about, you know, and I think it's maybe more broadly. Uh, I think it actually, you know, it's a letter I think that he was reading from a parent who had um, gay kids. And she's saying these kids, you know, they prayed and prayed that God would take this from them, but God didn't. You know, they prayed, but God didn't answer that prayer. God didn't take the, the, the desire the away. The desire but... for the sin away. And, you know, this is, Andy kind of makes this claim more than once in this discussion that he has on this service. You know, that gay people have prayed to God that he would change them, but God wouldn't. Um, almost, and again, you would get the sense that what he's saying here is that these gay Christians, they're more faithful than God. That's basically what he's telling you, right? They cried out to God. They did their part, but God was deaf to their cries, right? God is the one that let them down, you know? So if, in Andy's mind, if you want someone to blame, blame God. That's what he's telling you. You know, if God wasn't such an unloving, unwilling Lord, then these people would have been changed. Therefore, because God didn't do his part, these people are fine just the way they are. Is that, basically what he's telling you. But that's so, that's just so stupid. Because just because you're a Christian doesn't mean you don't struggle against sin. We struggle against sin our whole lives. But he gives us the power to overcome and as you, as you draw closer to God, he draws closer to you. Your love and knowledge of Christ grows, and the desire for sin lessens. It's not that you can't ever sin. You can definitely put yourself on the path. Um, don't put yourself in situations where you're going to be tempted, because Scripture says we sin when we give in. We give in to desire um, God doesn't cause us to sin. God doesn't tempt us. Um, yeah, God never tempts us to sin. So just because you have a, a desire or you're tempted, um, that doesn't mean that you have to give into it. That God, like, because we all are going to struggle forever. Like, that's just a lame argument. Is my point? Like, I still have temptations to sin in certain areas and like you can't say you never have a desire to sin. No. And it's not even an, a, like an actual real life, um, I guess, concept that somehow being a Christian, your life's supposed to be free from burden, free from struggle, free from the temptation, right. free from nowhere in scripture. Does it say that it does say that, you know, God will give us the power to overcome that. The a Holy way Spirit out will give us a way out. Yeah. You know, but even from the very beginning, um, Genesis 4, verse 7, when God's talking to Cain, he says, if you do well, um, will not your countenance be lifted up? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door and its desires for you, but you must master it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say, if you do well, sin's no longer at your door. No, it's at your door. You must master it. Right, We spend our life doing this, and the Holy Spirit working through us helps us be able to master it. 
But this idea that, well, the temptation never left, that's the same for everybody. I mean, yeah. everybody that's ever lived is prone to a sin in one given direction or another. Mm -hmm. it may not be sexual sin, yeah. it may be drunkenness. I mean, if you talk to alcoholics, yep. they'll call it basically a medical condition. Like, you know, and a lot of times, whether it's right or wrong, but you'll hear, hear people that even overcome alcoholism, they'll still say, I'm an alcoholic. Th this is why I don't drink. This is why I don't give myself even a taste of alcohol, because I'm an alcoholic. And I have to, you know, be on guard against this mm -hmm. temptation in my life. Yeah, just at keep all it times. away from your face. Don't let it tempt you. For the homosexual, I don't know. You can't be around other homosexuals. Like, you're both tempting each other. Two alcoholics hanging out together. They're going to be like, hey, you like the same thing I do. Let's just do that. Yeah, it's no different in this idea, again, that the temptation wasn't somehow removed in its entirety. Therefore, God is powerless and he is accepting of that sin now is completely unbiblical. So it's not its own category. That is such a, such a lie. You know, but Andy, and I would say all of those that are like him, they kind of position themselves as holier than God right? They're more yeah. just and they're more righteous than God. They're even more loving than God because while God wouldn't accept and he wouldn't help these people, Andy will. That's what his church is for, right? He'll accept all these people who God has apparently rejected. What they preach is treacherous. What Andy Stanley well, preaches is treacherous. What, is the, what do they say to those people who were homosexuals and God did answer their prayer? So that's like, yeah, God is powerful enough to to break this but then at the same time he's saying no not this one it's who you are but okay there's so many people with that testimony they yeah, used be to be homosexual and now they're not anymore i mean i know people who have kids who aren't anymore they once were and now they're not they're grown up they're married to the opposite gender yeah i knew people that were raging alcoholics and they don't drink anymore. Yeah. We've seen the power of it's God working people's works. lives. Why is this sin the one that Jesus just can't do anything about? But the fact is, is like, you're not going to find Andy Stanley's in the Bible. You're not going to find those as being, you know, in Hebrews 11, you know, listed in the hall of faith, those sorts of men. Mm -hmm. You won't find though the Andy Stanley types in there. Those men, you know, they preached God's word. They spoke God's word. They didn't make apologies for God. They held people to account for their sins and their misdeeds. And Andy Stanley, he is quite the opposite. So again, he would probably say, I, I never prescribed to the faith of Paul. I never prescribed to the faith of Peter. I never prescribed to the faith of David or any of these people. Um, and that should be, again, alarming to us. He makes accommodations for your misdeeds. He excuses away your sins, and he tells you it's God's fault at the end of the day. He preaches a salvation without transformation. It's a gospel of cheap grace, if you will, and it's a powerless God that Andy Stanley preaches. Um, and I would say Andy Stanley is not a kind man who gets things wrong. I think he's a dangerous man who will lead people to hell. Um, I think you should flee from his teachings and those like him, because I think anyone that's downplaying the severity of sin or the transformational power of Christ in the gospel is somebody that we should flee from and that we should warn others of, which is essentially what we're doing today and why we're doing it. Flee from these people for the salvation of your soul. So why is this important to Christians? Um, and look, we're not, I guess, sitting here telling you that we somehow have all the answers on how to handle sexual sin or any sin for that matter. Um, but the answer to that question is never to just accept the sin, you know, or to tolerate the sin, accept unrepentant lifestyles, and then call those people loved by God. That's never the solution. Um, you know, Jesus said, know the truth and the truth will set you free. Uh, let me pull it up here. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. Do you want to read it? 
If you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Yeah. Yeah. If you continue in my word. Continuing. Not if you like my words, you know, if they make good wall art in your home, or if Bethel music can put them to a catchy tune, then you're my disciples. He doesn't say that, right? He said, if you continue in them, then you are his disciples. So conversely, if you don't, then you aren't. Um, Matthew chapter 24, verse 13 says, only those who endure till the end will be saved. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's important to Christians. And <clears throat> what should we do about it? I think just what we said, you should flee from this teaching um, if you're in it, and you should warn others to do the same. Mm -hmm. You know, if uh, if our Christian walk, uh, or in our Christian walk, I should say, we should not seek ease and comfort. Um, we should seek the truth. That should be the plan, not yeah. acceptance of where we are, but we should seek the truth and it then the comes. power to get us into that truth. Um, there's a great quote from John Kelvin. He said, the Lord has not redeemed you so you might enjoy pleasures and luxuries, but rather so you should be prepared to endure mm. all sorts of evils. Yeah. Um, and that's a message that's certainly lost in our society, certainly lost to the Andy Stanleys of the world, but it can't be lost on us. Again, if we're going to know the truth, then we need to know the truth. Um, Jesus in John chapter 17, let me pull it up if you want to read it, honey. John chapter 17, verse 14 and 15. I have given them your word, um, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. I love that whole prayer, Jesus prays to the Father, like that's... Yeah, the high priestly prayer. Um, so how should we pray about it? You know, Christians should be praying about everything. And I think here we see, you know, Christ prayed for us. Um, and I think we should pray for ourselves in the same manner there, that we would not be of the world, you know, because it's the world that tolerates sin. It's the world that seeks to make everything easy and comfortable Mm -hmm. um, so we should pray that we wouldn't be that same way, that we wouldn't tolerate sin like the world, that we wouldn't seek our own ease and comfort mm -hmm. above all things. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the world that despises God's word. So we should pray that we wouldn't despise God's word, even if it's hard, uh, because it is hard at times. You know, again, going back to what we touched on before, this idea that this sexual sin is in this completely different stratosphere than all other sins, and no one else besides those afflicted by it have any mm -hmm. way of dealing with it's a complete lie. Um, we shouldn't despise God's word. Um, that's what the world does. That's what sinners do. We need to love God's word, do our best to walk in it, and trust that he is powerful enough mm -hmm. to set us free. That's what it means to point them, because he brings up pointing your kids to Christ. Um, but we need to understand what that means from the Bible, not his definition of what it means to point your children towards Christ. Um, he's the one who sets us free from the power of sin, all sin. Um, you really diminish Christ. Um, and Satan loves that. He loves that gospel <laughs> that Andy Stanley's preaching because it's Satan wants to be more powerful than Christ. And this is the one area Satan seems to be more powerful than Christ in. He doesn't complete the work he began in you. No, Christ does a complete work. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed from all sin. Yeah, I would say Satan is perfectly comfortable with you sitting in a church that preaches a powerless, um, unwilling Christ. Mm. There's no, there's no a, danger there. It's a totally different God, completely different. He is holding on to this one sin. It's too different. It's too hard for God. That's a completely different God he's preaching. So um, in that vein, with our recommended listening this week, um, we are going to recommend go and give a listen to someone who might stick a little closer to um, biblical orthodoxy there with Bodhi Bakum and his biblically informed case against homosexuality. Um, so we don't recommend you go and listen to Andy Stanley. 
you know, there's no reason to fill your head with uh, untruth. It was hard to listen to. It was very cringy listening to all that whole thing. I might have mentioned it before. Um, uh, listening to that MacArthur Center podcast, one of the things John MacArthur mentioned, and you know, he went to Bible college or whatever, and he was debating whether or not to go back and get his master's degree in whatever school he was going to go to. You know, they were kind of talking to him about the master's degree program or something, and he basically, I can't remember the exact way it worked out, but he basically told the the person, he's like, I've spent my entire life seeking and learning the truth. I'm not going to spend the next four year, years learning lies, so I'm not going to go to your school, <laughs> basically. And like, So don't go and listen to the lies of Andy Stanley. It doesn't do your soul any good. Um, but that's all we got. Uh, we will be back next Saturday. Uh, we'll see what the world throws at us. Um, we keep trying to make room to get back to our Bible topic. Maybe that'll be our focal point. We'll see. Um, cause talking about sin and discussing sin, obviously important. Um, maybe somebody should talk to Andy Stanley about that, but otherwise, uh, we'll be continuing on through our reformation month you know reformer quotes as we go through we're talking about john kelvin currently and then um that's about it we won't be back on saturday with our daily bible reading again we're going to try to free up some more time for other things that are important in our life but uh, we will still be back saturday with the podcast so until then hope you guys have a blessed week